you have your Bible, turn to Psalms 37. Uh, we've been in Psalms 37 now for a few weeks, and today in the three weeks that follow, we're going to continue to talk about what it means to trust in the Lord. That's what Psalms 37 is all about. It is my favorite psalm of all the psalms. Um, Steve Parr wrote a book about the psalms this particular past week. Maybe some of you saw it on Facebook. He said, uh, uh, type in on Facebook your favorite psalm and your name. And he said, I'll put it part of the uh, addition to the book. And I said, Psalms 37, Brian Stevens. He wrote back and said, thanks. And uh, I, I am grateful for Psalms 37. I'm grateful for what it means in my life. It was written by King David after he had gone through a lot of life. He was kind of old and at the end, but he could look back and he could say, see that God was always, always faithful. And really everything in Psalm 37 follows this one thing, what it means to trust in the Lord. And I think that that's something that if we're going to know Christ, if we're going to know Him as Lord, if we, if we have come to know Him as Savior, but we know that He's the Almighty who knows us by name, who knows every thought that we think, every hair on our head. He knows what we're going to face today. And He's already prayed for us before we even face this day. Before the next thing comes, God knows that what those things are. That's the kind of God that He is. If we know that God, if we start to know about that God, then we know that He loves us with an everlasting love and that His hand is actively working in our life then we need to come to the place in time where we say, Lord, you're a God up there, but you're also the God here. And I trust what you're doing in my life. I trust that what I can't handle, you can. I trust that what I don't know how to do, you do know how to do it, and you can lead me in how to do it. I trust that when the world that is not always pleasing comes against me, and comes against me for harm, that you will be there to help me, and comfort me, and strengthen me, and yes, that word, and use me for your honor and glory. If he is God, then he can do all things. He is the one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. If you know Christ as Savior and Lord, and you've received that gift of the Holy Spirit, you know the whisper of God. You know His voice. And you know what it is to go through dark times and hard times and difficult times. And yet He's the God that can be there with you. So we understand that uh, trust is an action word. So we're going to have to actively learn to trust Him. And that's the only way that we're going to learn to trust Him is by actively trusting Him in our life as we go through difficult things. And the thing about it is, is that we don't always do that. We would rather rely upon our wisdom and our own knowledge and our own thoughts. But God loves us enough to help us to understand this, that the greatest thing that we could ever do in all of life is to trust Him. So as we understand Him, we don't worry. Psalms 37 uses that word fret. We don't fret. We trust Him. I might not know the answer, but I know the one who does. So I don't worry. I'm not going to just uh, prejudge something before the time. I'm just going to let God be God in my life. I'm going to trust Him to do those things, and God's going to help me to do that. So we don't fret. We learn to do the next right thing that's in front of us. We learn to just say yes. To do the next good thing that God would have us to do. So today... In the three weeks that follows this, uh, we're going to look at what David did in Psalms 37 and the four things that he said really makes up what it means to trust in God. If you say you trust in God, then you're going to be doing these four things in your life. Stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. You see it there on the screen. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord. And He the Almighty, shall give you a grace gift, the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. You may be seated. I'm not sure that there is a more uh, mispreached, misused word 
misquoted, misunderstood word than Psalms 37, 4. I mean, there's some really shabby preaching out there that tells you all the things that this verse doesn't really say. But they think that they like it, so they hold on to it. As a matter of fact, what they do is they focus on the last part of that verse. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, when people hear that, they say, hey, I like this. God's going to give me the desires of my heart. I'm all in. What is it that I need to do so that God would give me all the desires of my heart? Well, delight in the Lord. Oh, okay. There's a preacher in Texas. He's very famous. He's written books. He's on TV. I call him Gomer Pyle. He turns out like this. He just, he's just always smiling. He's always talking like this. I think he goes to the dentist every week. Matter of fact, I think they got a hinge back there in the back of his jaw. This makes him smile all the time. And his wife's got the same hinge. She does the same thing all the time. And this is what they say. Just be happy. Just go through life and just smile and smile. You remember old Gomer Pyle? All he did, he just smiled. And some of y'all don't know who that is. I'm here to tell you that they, it's nothing wrong to be happy in life. It's nothing wrong to smile when you go through the difficult things in life. But how many of y'all have had difficulty? Have had hard times? How many of you, how many of you are just kind of like me sometimes? You just want to sit in a chair and not say a word and say, I dare you to speak to me. Right? Sometimes we just want to be alone. We just want to let me stew in my misery. I don't like it. I'm not going to like it. That's just the way that it is. We, we think, it. well, if i got to be happy for God to like me, if i got to be happy all the time, I'm just not going to make it. Well, guess what? That's not what the word delight means. There's also a group of preachers out there. They take it and just say, well, you know, it, God is a God of love. And the second part of that verse says, He shall give you the desires of your heart. So you just find out what you want. And you just claim it in Jesus' name. And you just be delighted that God's going to give it to you. And God will give you whatever you so want, whatever you claim. There's a good biblical word for that. Hogwash. Amen? It's first kin to this other word. Baloney. It's just not there. It's just not there. As a matter of fact, if you want to witness, I can take you to many people in the Bible and they'll tell you that that whole prosperity stuff, or you just claim it and that's the way it's going to be and, and, and God just is like a puppet on the string and you just tell God what you want and God's just going to bring it to you. So you just claim the riches and He'll bring you the riches. And Hold on. That's not what happened to Christ. It's not what happened to every one of His followers. Every one of them were martyred for the faith. Jesus, uh, Jesus bragged on a man and said, none greater born of women than a man by the name of John the Baptist who was in jail because of an ungodly man by the name of Herod and he got his head chopped off and he never did the wrong thing. So don't tell me all this name it and claim it stuff. I'm not, I tell you, God can do whatever he wants to do. He's that kind of a God. But he is God and you aren't. There's something that this verse is saying that they're missing out on. What they want to do is they want to take this verse and translate it into their wants. So he says he'll give me whatever my heart wants, whatever the desire of my heart is, and this is my, my desire. You can't always have that. Though sometimes God will let you have some of those things. It was never God's will in the life of David to be at the wrong place, which is where he was, at the wrong time, to be up on the top of his flat house on the roof and see a woman bathing. What he should have done is turn his head and walk away. Can the women say amen? That's right. He should have just said, oh, I'm sorry, and just walked away. But you know what he did? He looked, and he paused, and he pondered. And an ungodly desire came up within him. And he called to a servant 
Where's the shame in this? He called for a servant to come over and say, who is that? Oh, king, you mean the woman bathing? I, I guarantee the servant was embarrassed to even look, right? But that's Bathsheba. Go get her. Bring her to me. Can you imagine what it was like for that servant to walk through his house? Where are you going in such a hurry? Don't ask. And then she comes back with that servant, and the servant takes her up to where David was. And you knew what happened from there. That may have been a desire on his heart, but that wasn't God's desire. When we get to this place where we're, we're going to act like we know what is best, and we ask God to do something that may be out of his will, God's not, gonna, not, God's not in that. God's in here to bless you. God's in here to, to bring greatness in your life. But that's not going to come except by love, by truth, by righteousness, by goodness. God's going to do great and wonderful things in your life, but you're going to have to let God be God. He wants to give you the very best, and He's not going to allow anything else. Let's talk about this word, delight. We need to learn what this word delight means. I don't often do this. Some people were, after the first service, were in the parking lot laughing with me about this. This word delight in the Hebrew, let me pronounce it for you. Ahag. Ahag. Men, that's not your wife we're talking about. Amen? No elbows, please. But it is a verb. It is an action word. I guarantee you, I'll never forget how to pronounce uh, uh, delight in Hebrew. Ahag. It means this. It means soft. It means um, to be very um, delicate. It means to be very pliable. It means to live or to spend uh, in enjoyment, to take exquisite delight in a thing, to be soft, delicate, and pliable. Not hardened, not rough, not weathered and not bendable, but pliable. Let me read to you some verses out of Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah chapter number 9. I was going to read a lot of it, but I'm just going to bring it down to just two verses. And this is a quote from God. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, though we know many who do. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. We know them as well. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. We know those people. That's what they're trusting in. Their wisdom, their might, their riches. But let him who glories glory in this. This is God. That he understands me and knows me. That I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness. That word exercising, He is bringing it forth in our life. This is what God is doing, exercising loving kindness. He wants to do that in our life that is loving and kind. He also is judgment, exercising judgment and righteousness in the earth. Listen to God. For in these I delight. So hold on. What we know is if it is of God, if it is loving, if it is truthful and right, if it is beneficial, God delights in that. That's what God wants in your life. Are you okay with God bringing you that which is loving and good and truthful and right? And if you want to do something else, are y'all okay with God not doing that? How many of y'all been very grateful that God didn't answer some prayers? Yes? And we were grateful that God did answer some prayers. Amen? And I look back on it and I see that God was always good, always right. If I could take verse 4, and I, Psalms 37, 4, and, and I could give you the Brian version of it. 
when it said, delight yourself in the Lord, it would be this. Let the Lord be the good in your life. Let the Lord be the right in your life. Let the Lord bring love and justice into your life. Let the Lord be the delight of your life. And He'll give you the desires of your heart. Literally, it's like this. Y'all listening? When we start to seek after God, as it said in Jeremiah, when we understand Him and know Him, then His heart becomes our heart. His desires become our desires. And we delight in Him and His way And we're so amazed by it and changed by it that that's what we want. The desires of good that we know God will bless. The desires of blessing and protection and and, and kindness and provision. I I had some examples of this I was going to share today. I I had one that, that was just an example I came up with and on the way to church this morning, I just decided, you know, that's a really good example. I just don't, I just don't feel led to give it. And I got thinking about it. If it's all right with you, I want to talk about the Lord for just a second. Can I do that? He had been preaching all day long, ministering, helping people out. He was tired. He got his disciples and said, let's get into a boat. We'll go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He knew as long as he was there with those people that he was never going to get a break. And as he got into the boat, he was tired and he fell asleep. A storm came up, began to rock that boat. The disciples, by the way, some of those disciples were professional fishermen. They had been on that lake many, many times. And they they came to Jesus. They weren't trusting in the Lord. They were kind of mad. They said, Lord, don't you care that we're about to perish? Jesus woke up. Oh, ye a little faith. Don't you know that God can take care of us? It may look bad. Don't you know God is there for us? And he said, peace, be still. Literally, hush, be calm. And the winds and the waves ceased. And the boat quit rocking. And they began to be more afraid of the power of Christ than they did even of the winds and the waves. I believe the Lord probably went back to sleep, don't you? The next day they get to shore. They come walking out. And there's a man who runs up to them. Let me tell you about this man. Had a hard life, a difficult life. A life that was filled with hardship and pain and brokenness and broken relationships. There was just something within him that always was doing the wrong thing. It got to the place that he couldn't even be in his family with his family any longer. Y'all know what I mean when when I say burnt bridges? He had burnt all the bridges he could burn. People saw him and wanted to go in the opposite direction. And he was so controlled by this evil that was within him that that they could not keep clothes on him. They would arrest him and he would break out. They could not chain him. They couldn't tie him with ropes. They, They could not keep clothes on him. And he lived among the tombs. But when Christ was there, he ran to be where Christ was, and he fell down on his knees before the the Son of God because there was like a magnet in Christ that he was drawn to him. What he came for was help and relief. There were demons that were inside of him. And those demons that were inside of him knew who Jesus was. And they said, they they didn't want to be cast out and thrown into the bottomless pit. They said, there's some some pigs over there. Can we go and stay in them? And Jesus said, be gone. 
And those demons left that man and went inside those pigs. And those pigs would not tolerate it and ran into the water and drowned. Isn't it funny what man will allow, even an animal would never allow? And those people that were taking care of those pigs ran into the town and told the ones that, that owned the pigs and the townspeople what had happened. And they came out. And they found Jesus. And they saw that man. They saw him clothed, sitting down, I love this word. He was in his right mind. Now they knew this man. He had probably terrorized all of them. The crazy man who lives among the tombs. The man that the police can't do anything about. Nobody can do anything about. But Christ changed him. When Jesus was getting into the boat to go back, back to ministry again, this man, and the word the Bible uses is this man begged Jesus that he could go with him. Jesus said, no. Go back to your family. Go back to your friends. And let them see what God has done. You see, what happened in this man's life is Jesus had become the delight of his life. Jesus had changed him. Luke 8 talks about three women who followed Jesus in his ministry. One of them's name was Mary. And she came and when she met Christ, she also had demons. She had seven demons within her. But she lived her life. She wasn't like Legion living among the tombs. She was a businesswoman, and actually she made a lot of money because the money that she and these other two women had actually paid for Jesus in his ministry. And they followed him everywhere that he went, even to the point of he, she was there at the cross when Jesus was crucified. She was there when Jesus was laid in the tomb. And she was the one that on Resurrection Sunday morning, she was the first person to the tomb. And she was the first one that Jesus presented himself to, Mary Magdalene. Someone that came broken and in need and met one who met her need. And, be, and he did such an amazing thing in her life that he became the delight of her life. And all that she desired was to please him. I think about Matthew, a tax collector. Matthew, who <laughs> probably made a lot of money and built a business, and, but he had heard Jesus, heard him preach, heard him teach. One day Jesus came by and Jesus looked at Matthew and said, Hey, why don't you just follow on with me? You know what Matthew did? Everything that he built, everything that he worked for, everything, all the labor, everything that he did, he just totally walked away from and he became a follower of Christ. And he followed him every step of the way. Even to the place where after Jesus died and rose again and went back to heaven, Matthew continued to serve Christ and was a martyr for the faith. Giving his life for the cause of Christ because Jesus was there and changed him and Jesus became the delight of his life. I think about another tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus. You ever heard of him? He heard about Christ and he heard what Christ could do. And, and he knew if, if, if all the brokenness that was within him, if he could just hear him, if he could just meet him, maybe Christ would do with him what he had done in others. And, and the barriers that were there, he didn't let those barriers get in the way. And he climbed up a tree so he could see and hear. But listen, the one that he came to see saw him. And the one that he heard about knew him and called him by name. And said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus was so changed, he said, look, half of what I have, 
all that I have, half of what I have, I give to the poor. And by the way, if I'm stolen or cheated from anyone, I will give back fourfold. When Jesus comes in, he changes us. Jesus becomes the delight of your life. He becomes your everything. I think about that woman who lived a very bad life, a wrong life. Matter of fact, a lot of us would be embarrassed to even have known such a person who would live in such a way. She was actually caught in the very act of adultery. I think it was a frame job. I think that they knew what they were doing, and they were going to use her to pawn, as a pawn to see if they could get back at Jesus. But they grabbed her in that moment. I don't know if they gave her a sheet to put on or if they just drug her away naked. And they knew where Jesus was, and they drug her to where Jesus was with rocks in their hands, and they threw her in Jesus' presence and said, the law says that she should be stoned. What do you say? They didn't care about her. They didn't care about Christ. He had patience, much more patience than I would have had. He wisely said, you who are without sin cast the first stone. And you could hear as the rocks began to slowly drop out of people's hands. And they began to walk away because they knew that they had sinned as well. And with tenderness and love, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. I've often wondered, what was it like in her life 20 minutes later? An hour later, two or three hours later, and she's thinking about what happened and how embarrassed she was and how she felt and how the, she heard all the anger from everyone. But she heard the tender words of Christ who didn't condemn her. He said, neither do I condemn you. And she received a new chance, a new opportunity. Go and sin no more. The next week, the next month, do you think she still felt the touch, the love, the acceptance? The next year, the next time, some hardship came into her life. And you know the devil, how he loves to talk in your ear and tell you you're not worthy and, and, and no one loves you and you might as well just give up and go on. But yet, no, no, there was one. Christ, what an amazing person he was. And Christ became the delight of her life. And because Christ was the delight of her life, all of her life was given. And Christ met her there and Begin to grow her and bless her and help her and lead her and use her. And she knew what it meant that God would grant the desires of her heart. David, when he wrote the 23rd Psalm, he said these words about our Christ. He restores my soul. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever stood in need of a revival? You ever stood in need of another touch? For those who do not know Christ, they don't know what it means to have peace. They don't know what it means to have someone that means more to you than anything else. But for those who do know Christ, have we forgotten have we let other things become the delight of our life? Are we satisfied with counterfeit? Are we satisfied with earthly riches and earthly things and earthly fame? And are we satisfied with, with our ways? 
Wasn't it Solomon who said, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death? Are we tired of living for that which doesn't last and is not significant and is not meaningful in our life? Maybe we need to remember the one that we found delight in. Maybe we need to remember when our life was changed and how we felt. Maybe we, maybe we need to feel like when all those sins were rolled off of us and our heart was filled with something that just could not ever go away, the saturation of the goodness of God within us. Maybe we need to remember that God loves us with an everlasting love. And maybe we need to remember that God loves those others as much as He loves us. I wonder if that woman caught in adultery remembers that God loved the ones that had the rock in their hands as much as He loved her. And if you have been so blessed, if you have met such a loving Savior, is He the delight of your life? Is He your all in all? Are you satisfied with living a life a guilty distance from God when He wants to draw you close? Please hear this. My time is gone. Every one of us are as close to God as we want to be. And we're as far away from God as we choose to be. Maybe we just need to remember, maybe we need to go back and begin to delight in the Lord again. You'll never know what it means to trust in the Lord until you begin to delight in the Lord.